Tears of the Kingdom is an incredible game that annoyed me to no end. At certain times, the game gave me a feeling of childlike wonder and amazement like I've never felt before. And 10 minutes later, the game had me almost throw my controller at a wall. At least in my opinion, the game deserves every 10 out of 10 it got and it deserves all the Game of the Year awards it is inevitably going to win. But I also think I've never played a game with a worse control scheme. The game features incredible moments that are crafted with so much love and care, yet it also features some of the most baffling design decisions I've ever seen. To put it mildly, Tears of the Kingdom is a game whose heights are incredibly high. But, at least in my humble onion, it is also a game whose lows are really low. But weirdest of all, a lot of those problems would have been easily avoidable. The longer I think about the game and all its problems, the more it has me worried about the current state of Nintendo. So, I believe there is a story hidden in the depths of Tears of the Kingdom. A story about Nintendo's priorities when it comes to game design. And a story about something that is currently going on at the company that has me worried about the future of the Zelda franchise as a whole. In this video, we are hopefully going to dig up this story piece by piece. We are going to discuss the entire game chronologically while discussing certain aspects of its design along the way. We are going to discuss how the game improves over Breath of the Wild in certain areas while amplifying Breath's problems in others. We'll dissect the combat system and discuss how the game got made in the first place. We will find out why I always accidentally throw away my weapon when I actually want to use Ultra Hand and why the incredible physics system has me worried about the next Zelda game. And much, much more. As for spoilers, since we are going chronologically through the game, the spoilers will naturally Really ramp up while watching. So if you're currently playing the game, you can just stop watching when it begins to spoil things for you. But just to be clear, in its entirety, this video is going to spoil the entire game. Like everything, including the final boss fight. Don't worry, that is not the final boss fight in the background yet, that's just me, elaborately torturing a Korok seed. Alright, we got a ton to cover today, so better let's get this thing going. My name is Seath, you're watching Seath Perspective, a place that hopes to give perspective on interesting aspects of great games. This is The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. Our story, to save the mystical land of Hyrule, starts before Hyrule is even in danger. The game begins with us and Zelda investigating strange ruins below Hyrule Castle. A depiction on the wall tells us the story of the Sonai, a legendary race who lived in Hyrule thousands of years ago and who defeated an evil demon king. Deeper down in the ruins, we discover a mysterious creature bound by some sort of magic. And then something interesting happens. Tears of the Kingdom's narrative now suddenly kicks in, but we have no idea what is actually going on. A huge part of the story of the game is it to puzzle together what actually happened in the sequence. That's a really unique approach to telling the story of a Zelda game. And while the narrative certainly has problems, I found the way it's presented refreshing and I think it works well for the game. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The second we arrive at the demonic creature, the spell is broken. The creature awakens in a surprisingly dark and unsettling scene. Suddenly, Zelda becomes attacked by a dark, magical force. Link is able to step in at just the right moment, but the darkness steals away his powers and corrupts his arm. We aren't able to beat the creature, even the Master Sword breaks. The creature talks to us for a moment, telling us that it knows who we are before lifting the entire castle of Hyrule into the sky. Amongst the chaos, Zelda drops into the abyss and a strange bright light makes her disappear. Meanwhile, Link gets saved by a magical hand. This hand belongs to Raru, the former Sonai King of Hyrule and it is the game's excuse to give us new rune powers. Namely, Ultra Hand to build together machines, Ascend to, well, ascend through ceilings, Fuse to fuse items onto our weapons and shields, and Rewind, which allows us to return certain objects back in time. Zelda disappeared, the Master Sword is gone, Hyrule is in danger, and we, well, we, find ourselves in the middle of a floating island. That's the main premise of the game. At this point, we have no clue what happened to Zelda and to the Master Sword, and solving those mysteries is our main task in the game. The Sky Island is the tutorial area, and our first task is to gain our main abilities in four shrines across the floating island. And with this, the game officially begins. And for me, it started with a catastrophe. See, at one point, we retrieve the Sheikah Slate, now known as Pura Pet, and are taught that we can mark places in the distance by viewing them through the device. While this is explained, there are two shrines shown, one in the far distance on a mountain and one equally far away on land close to a lake. So for whatever reason, I didn't notice the shrine at the lake, but only focused on the one on top of the mountain, which is the exact moment when disaster struck. 
See, silly me thought the game wants me to visit this shrine first. I even marked it on my newly gained Pura pet, thinking that this is the first objective. So I found a way to the mountain where it is placed, which was a bit weird, but possible. This took me to a cold area where I cooked the meal to stay warm. There I figured out a way to climb the seemingly unclimbable surface, which was surprisingly complicated for a tutorial area, but again, a solvable problem for a settler veteran. And would you believe it? I actually made it to the second shrine first. <laughs> The only problem, I had no idea that I just broke the intended tutorial sequence. After the second shrine, the one that I did first, the game tutorializes the flight machines. Those bring us directly to where we need to go after doing both shrines. But that's not where I had to go next. I had to go to the cursed lake shrine that I missed earlier. But once I finally made it to this shrine, there was no clear path back towards the temple. So I actually had to loop back up the mountain for a second time. Or in other words, my playthrough of Tears of the Kingdom started with almost an hour of completely unnecessary backtracking. So am I mad at the game because of this? Well, I certainly was at the moment, but looking back, it's probably more my fault than the game's. The game shows the correct shrine to go to much more prominently. I just missed it because I wasn't paying close attention. The reason I'm bringing this up isn't because I think it's a flaw with the game's design or anything. I'm bringing it up because I think the fact that the game did not prevent me from sequence breaking the tutorial is really interesting and says a lot about how Nintendo designed Tears of the Kingdom. Tears of the Kingdom is a game that doesn't shield players from frustration, like so many modern AAA games do. Tears values player freedom higher than it values preventing frustration. Thus, it did not stop me from sequence breaking the tutorial, even though it overall led to a really frustrating experience for me. And funnily enough, I can respect that. Tears of the Kingdom is all about player freedom. If the game is truly about freedom, then it also means that if I really want to frustrate myself, well, then I should have the freedom to do so. The game allows me to have a bad time with it. It's thematically cohesive. My personal guess is that whenever the question arose if they should limit a player's freedom somewhere in order to potentially prevent the player from having a frustrating experience, they decided to value player freedom higher because the game is all about freedom. So overall, I ended up not enjoying my first couple of hours with Tears of the Kingdom because I'm an idiot. But I also kind of respect that the game allowed me to be an idiot. Hooray! What's next? Well next let's discuss how the shrines in Tears of the Kingdom are designed to begin with. Because as it turns out, they are designed in a completely different way than they were in Breath of the Wild. The Witness is an incredibly interesting game. In The Witness, we find ourselves seemingly without a purpose, stranded on a mysterious island that we have to explore. On this island, there is nothing but tons of simple draw a line puzzle boards. The Witness is a game about nothing but exploring an island and solving simple draw a line puzzles. And it is great. It's great for a simple reason, which is also the reason why we're talking about the game in a video about Tears of the Kingdom. There are hundreds of those simple puzzles and we can already reach most of those at the very beginning of the game. We can reach them, but we can't solve them yet. And this is not because we lack an item or a necessary skill. It isn't because our, I don't know, imaginary puzzle solving level isn't high enough. And it isn't because we need to defeat a boss before those become solvable or anything. The reason is something different, something much more interesting. We lack the knowledge on how exactly those puzzles work. Here's an example. Early in the game, we run into puzzle boards that feature little black dots all over them. But we have no idea what to do with those black dots. However, if we explore the island thoroughly, at some point we'll stumble into a couple of puzzle terminals that are deliberately designed to teach us what to do with those black dots. We have to draw our line through all of them to solve the puzzle. So the puzzles we've seen previously were already solvable. We just lack the knowledge on how to do it. The only barrier between us and the game is our knowledge of the game systems. There is no character progression in the witness. Instead of leveling up our character, we become better at the game because our own understanding of its systems grows. The whole game is designed around this idea and in my opinion, this is one of the most interesting ways to design games. Barely anything feels as rewarding as a reward than new knowledge on how to interact with the world does. Which neatly brings us back to our quest to save princesses. Zelda. So what has all of this to do with the shrines in Tears of the Kingdom? Well, interestingly enough, a lot of the shrines in Tears of the Kingdom are very similar to the sequence of small puzzles that teaches us how the black dots in the witness work. Most of the shrines in Tears aren't really puzzles. Most of them are actually tutorials that disguise as puzzles and teach us about one element of the physics engine. They might explain to us that we are able to ride the falling stones back to the sky islands by reversing time, as the shrine near the woodland stables does. Another one might teach us how to use a certain sonar device, like the nail thing 
thing. Or it might teach us about a unique interaction between our powers, like this one. It explains that we are able to use Ultra Hand to draw a path for an object first and then to ride it backwards by using Rewind. The same way, the witness teaches us the black dot mechanic by showing us a series of puzzles that start simple and escalate in difficulty, Shrines often teach us unique interactions in the physics engine by showing us first the most simple interaction and then by slowly escalating it. And it's great, the shrines even often feature a hidden chest nearby that allows us to immediately test our newfound knowledge. When the shrines are at their best, they slowly expand our horizon of the game's physics system and lead to us slowly mastering the game. It's a really clever and smart way to teach us all the different interactions in the game, but it also comes with a drawback. If we already figured out how to do something ourselves, like I'm guessing most people probably already know how to build a flying machine by the time they reach this shrine, then the shrines lose all that makes them special. Instead of being clever hidden tutorials that turn into mindless build a vehicle boxes, which are the shrines at the worst. But overall the shrines are a great improvement over Breath of the Wild. They are a really clever way to teach us all the different aspects of the physics engine without drowning us in text tutorials. Great job on this front Nintendo. Sadly, it's a different story for the dungeons, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So after finishing the tutorial island, we're finally allowed to land in the center of Hyrule and are sent to the first town in the game. There we unlock the paraglider after a short quest and we learn about four regional phenomenons that we're supposed to investigate. Those four phenomenons are the four main quests that lead to the four dungeons in the game, the same way they already did in Breath of the Wild. One leads us to the Sora, one to the Gorons of Death Mountain, one to the Gerudo of the Desert and one well, one sends us to Rito Village. The game hints at this area being meant to be explored first, and it's where we are heading. So Rito Village is troubled by the sudden appearance of a weather phenomenon that caused a massive blizzard in the area. We have to first find and help Tulin, and afterwards make our way together with him towards the center of this weird weather phenomenon. So the path towards the Wind Temple is one of the highlights in the game. We ascend higher and higher far higher than we might think at first. It almost feels as if we were a bit out of bounds when we suddenly break through the clouds and dive towards the temple. Then the music suddenly kicks in and we experience one of the few moments of triumph while we dive down towards the ship in the center of the hurricane. It's a really strong moment. Sadly, the ship itself is not. Let's talk about the dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom. The dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom are, I don't know how else to put it, they are mediocre. They aren't like complete train wrecks, but they're really no highlights of the game either. They just are. They're filled with mediocre puzzles. They all have a theming, like the ship, but the theming is realized in a weak and careless way. Like, you know, this is a ship, but ignoring the shape of the thing, there is nothing that makes it a ship. There are no ship objects that we can interact with, or that we maybe even have to fuse together. The puzzles don't have anything to do with a ship. They are arbitrarily placed here. The enemies aren't pirates or anything. The dungeon is just a ship-shaped shrine, not an actual ship. I often hear the criticism that the dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom follow the same activate five devices that are spread over the place structure that the dungeons in Breath of the Wild already used. But I personally don't think that this is the problem here. The real problem isn't that the dungeons are non-linear. The real problem is that the dungeons lack any sort of personality. There is no story to this ship. It doesn't feature the rooms a ship would feature, like say a rowing room or a captain chamber or whatever. The whole thing lacks the feeling of being a real place. And I think that's why so many people, myself included, ended up finding the dungeons disappointing. Which is a pity, because the moment we decide sent onto the ship the first time, it is really hard not to feel the potential. Anyway, at least the boss fights are all right this time. All right to right. With the first dungeon boss down, Tulin's spirit is unlocked. From now on we are able to summon a gust of wind while flying. Hooray! Our next stop is Sora's domain, but before we visit everyone's favorite fish folk, let's talk about something different first. Something unique to Tears of the Kingdom, which is, at least in my opinion, the most drastic change of a Breath of the Wild. Let's talk about a complete shift in design philosophy. Let's talk about the one area where Tears of the Kingdom burns down the roots from which it grew. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about Pony Points. Stardew Valley is a game about living a simple life as a farmer. In Stardew Valley, we grow crops, breed chicken and befriend townspeople. On the surface, Stardew Valley is a very relaxing experience. But this is only on the surface. Because beneath this lovely facade of living a relaxing life as a farmer, a completely different video game is hidden. A hidden video game that is the gaming equivalent 
to crack cocaine. Stardew Valley is an insanely addictive video game. I can't tell you how often I picked up Stardew Valley to play for an hour before I go and cook something, only to finally manage to put it down at 3am, sitting in front of a bunch of empty chip bags. It's a game that completely consumes me every time I pick it up. So here's the interesting question. Why is Stardew Valley so addictive? What is it that makes this game so hard to put down? And what has all of this to do with Tears of the Kingdom? Here's the thing, Stardew Valley is not only a game about farming, it is also a game about rebuilding a community. At the core of the game is the community center. One of the main tasks in the game is it to rebuild the old community center. So how do we rebuild this center? Well, we do it by bringing certain items to it, which complete certain tasks. Whenever we complete one of those tasks, we get a small reward. Whenever we complete an entire section of the community center, we get a huge, sometimes game-changing reward. The different community center bundles our goals for the first half of the game. And I believe it's those goals that make the game so incredibly addictive. At any moment while playing, we have like 20 different tasks in mind. Catch a certain fish, plant a pumpkin during autumn, befriend the mayor, defeat enemies in the mines, melt gold, make mayonnaise, forage certain plants, and so on. The game drowns us in goals that we can complete in any order. Goals that are all at the back of our minds while playing. It gives us something meaningful to work towards at every moment of gameplay. It's one of the greatest strengths of Stardew Valley. Here's the thing, however. There is another way of thinking about all the different tasks in the community center. All of them require us to progress in some way and all of them lead to a reward. We can also think about them as progression bars that lead to a reward in disguise. Those small progression bars are actually part of even bigger progression bars, completing an entire room in a community center, which is yet another small item in an even bigger progression bar, completing the community center as a whole. Befriending the townspeople is a progression system that is headed towards a reward. Making our way down the mine is a progression system that leads to a meaningful reward. Even something as simple as planting a plant and watering it every morning is a tiny progression system in itself that leads to a tiny mini reward, the money we earn once we sell the grown plant. Stardew Valley drowns us in different meaningful progression bars that we all have access to at once. I believe that this is where Stardew Valley gets its addictive quality from. And it's great, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this, it's just a thing. A thing that shares a couple of things with Tears of the Kingdom. And with this, we're finally able to talk about Tears of the Kingdom again. And when I say Tears of the Kingdom, I actually mean Breath of the Wild. See, Breath of the Wild doesn't do progression systems that lead to a reward. Breath of the Wild actually goes out of its way to avoid it. There are only three systems in Breath that allow the player to progress. It's the Shrine Rewards, the Korok Seeds and the Fairy Upgrades. That's an incredibly low amount of systems for a game the size of Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild is all about intrinsic motivation to explore all it has to offer. It is almost entirely driven by our own curiosity. The game says experiencing the world is your reward and if you don't like doing something, we won't nudge you into doing it by giving you a feeling of progression. And I respect that the game does this. It makes the exploration feel a bit empty and pointless at times, but it is also different to all the other games out there. Breath of the Wild certainly has problems that come from its neglect to add tons of progression systems, but it also makes the game really unique to play. However, I believe it is also the reason why a lot of people bounced off heavily of Breath of the Wild. The lack of progression systems and rewards makes exploring the world just feel a bit meaningless after a while. And for some people, that's just a bigger problem than for others. Okay, so here is where this gets interesting. Stardew Valley is a game full of progression systems that lead to meaningful rewards. Meanwhile, Breath of the Wild is a game that tries to get rid of as many progression type rewards as possible. So what does Tears of the Kingdom do? And the answer is... Neither. Here's the thing, Tears of the Kingdom is a game full of progression systems, but it lacks meaningful rewards at the end of those progression bars. It's just progression bars. A lot of systems are just progression for progression's sake. It's in between the two extremes that Stardew Valley and Breath of the Wild are. It introduces tons of progression systems, but barely rewards progression. It's really weird, to be honest. Just take a look at all those different things that we can progress individually in Tears of the Kingdom. Additionally to shrines, Koroks and armor upgrades, the game features unlocking all the post statues, finding posts, exploring all 152 caves and killing the shiny Bulbasaur in them, visiting all 58 wells in the game, lighting all 120 light routes, finding all armor items, completing all quests, upgrading our batteries, clearing all Yiga hideouts, rebuilding all Edison signs, finding all Sage's will, clearing all monster forces, and of course, pony points. 
Pony points are probably the best symbol to pin this shift in design philosophy to. In Breath of the Wild, there is no reward tied to visiting the stables or to registering horses. The game expects that finding a stable is reward enough to visit the stables and that having a horse registered is, you know, reward enough to register a horse. In Tears of the Kingdom, however, those activities are tied to a progression system. It literally says X pony points till the next reward in the upper right corner to motivate us to capture another horse or whatever. So what is the final pony points reward, you might ask? Well, it's a whopping free endure carrots. And please don't get me wrong, I love my Endura Keros as much as the next guy, but it is really a small reward in comparison to the task we just completed. Most rewards in the game are this understated. The rewards for handing in shiny Bulbasaur hearts are nice, but nothing is game changing. Activating all light routes doesn't lead to a gameplay reward. Finding the final well in the game rewards exactly the same 10 rupees that finding the first well rewards. And completing all Edison signs rewards a fabric for the paraglider. It's progression systems without meaningful rewards at the end. It's just the progression bars. And as weird as this may sound, I think it works. There's a feeling of working towards something meaningful every time we complete a cave, every time we visit a well, every time we fix a sign or light a light route. Even though most of those progression systems aren't tied to anything meaningful, they still help us to set goals while playing. Tons of goals. So many goals that at times Tears of the Kingdom reached the addictive quality of Stardew Valley for me while playing. You know, it's not unusual to dive down from a sky view tower thinking, okay, I'll first grab the piece of gear that is hidden in this cave, then I'd jump down the chasm, light the light route and collect all the posts I can find on the way before I go to the shrine and get my fourth blessing, which I can then turn in in Kakariko where I still have to, wait, is this a Korok seed over there? The game drowns us in goals and I think this is the main reason why some people that bounced off of Breath of the Wild find themselves enjoying Tears of the Kingdom so much more. Which leaves us with the question, if this is overall a good thing or a bad thing? To which I have to reply, I don't know. It's hard to deny that those small progression systems help to give us long-term goals while playing, which makes the game a lot more addictive in Breath of the Wild, but they are also a bit, I don't know. Ubisoft desk? I guess I'm happy that one version of the game exists that is more thematically cohesive, Breath of the Wild, while one version exists that is more video gamey and more fun overall, Tears of the Kingdom. But the progression systems aren't the only thing where Tears of the Kingdom tried to fix some of Breath of the Wild's flaws. They fixed something even more important. Something that I believe might be the biggest achievement of Tears of the Kingdom overall, even though it is such a small change on paper. Tears of the Kingdom is the first open world game that I've ever played that, at least in my humble opinion, managed to solve the enemy scaling paradox of open world games. So what is the enemy scaling paradox of open world games? Well, if a world is truly open and every place explorable from the beginning, then there is always the problem of how to scale the enemies. You know, if the enemies do not scale, content almost always is inappropriate to the player's level. Most areas we'll visit will either be too hard or too easy for us. If enemies do scale, however, then the world feels arbitrarily created. Everything is always on the same power level as we are. There is no feeling of progression since the world progresses together with us. There are no areas where we can feel powerful since we outlevel them. And there are no areas that feel especially dangerous because well, because there are none, it's a catch-22 problem. If a game does one thing, it immediately loses out on the other, and the other way around. It's a problem that pretty much every open world game that I've ever played suffered from, in some form. In Skyrim, we never feel truly powerful since the enemies scale with us. In Witcher 3, high-level enemies are so over-the-top powerful that it makes exploring those areas early pointless. In Elden Ring, most players probably end up out-leveling some content. In Diablo 4, we sometimes gain a level or two and actually feel weaker since the enemies leveled as well. And in Breath of the Wild, the combat becomes tedious towards the end, since all enemies turn into silver bullet sponges. No game I've ever played found a good solution to this problem. Until Tears of the Kingdom. As far as I'm concerned, Tears of the Kingdom completely fixed this problem. Tears of the Kingdom uses a brilliant system that allows them to have it both ways. To actually scale all enemies appropriate to our current level, while still having areas that are too dangerous at the beginning and where we feel powerful later on. They found a brilliant solution that is so effective and so simple that I wish all open world games in the future use a similar system. So what is this brilliant solution, you might ask? Well, to the best of my knowledge, they just scale a single enemy in every camp. 
That's it. And it's insane how effective this is. If a camp consists of three red bokoblins in the early game, then a camp will consist of two red bokoblins and a blue one in the mid game and two red ones and a silver one in the very late game. Meanwhile, if a camp consists of two black bokoblins and a silver one by the late game, then it will be two black ones and a red one at the beginning of the game. They just have the difficulty of all but one enemy set in stone, while one enemy always scales. It's really funny because it's such an obvious solution in hindsight, yet to the best of my knowledge, Tears of the Kingdom is the first game to use a system like this. Hooray! So back to the story. There is still a lot to discuss for us. Sora's domain is plagued by disgusting mud that is falling from the sky. We get to speak to a bunch of people about this problem, have to figure out a really interesting puzzle where we have to shoot an arrow through a tear while standing at the correct spot, explore the ancient waterworks and finally make our way towards the water temple together with the Sora Sidon. The Sora quest is my least favorite one out of the four main quests. There is a bit too much backtracking going on for my taste in the first half of the quest. The second half is much better. Exploring the ancient waterworks feels like entering this mysterious ancient forbidden place and the path towards the water temple is incredible in my opinion. The dungeon however, well the dungeon ends up being the worst in a bunch of already mediocre dungeons. Also, that's a nitpick, but there is this puzzle with the turning device that just completely feels out of place. It's just so random that this puzzle here suddenly requires us to use bullet time to solve it. And I honestly have no idea how to complete this if we are either out of arrows or out of water fruits. But again, that's a nitpick. We defeat the boss in his temple, which is an okay boss fight, and we learn about the secret stones and the demon king for the first time. For a second time. That stone that you are wearing. Our next stop is Death Mountain, where we have to help the Gorons drop a nasty addiction problem. But before we do that, we have to discuss something else. We have to discuss the first big problem that I have with Tears of the Kingdom. We have to discuss the combat system. At the beginning of my Tears of the Kingdom playthrough, I did something stupid. I chose to take two heart pieces as my first upgrades, instead of grabbing two stamina vessels first. And that was a mistake, because by increasing my number of hearts, I actually made the game more difficult for myself. But one step after the other. In my opinion, Tears of the Kingdom's combat system has two big problems, namely the overabundance of healing and the terrible damage scaling. So the healing first. At any point during combat, we can open up the menu and eat a healing item. At literally any moment in combat. Link is basically invincible as long as he carries around enough apples. As the old saying goes, an apple a day keeps the moblins away. Because of this, the vast majority of fights in the game play out like this. Whenever we get hit, we open up the menu and heal back to full health. Until we get hit again, which causes us to pause again, and so on. This obviously breaks the flow of combat every time, which is the first big problem, and the first reason why increasing our maximum health at the beginning of the game makes combat actually more difficult. The second reason is the terrible damage scaling. The damage that enemies deal is based upon the weapon they carry. If an early game enemy carries a late game weapon, for example, it is very likely to one-shot us if we aren't wearing strong armor. This has the weird consequence that it is not unusual to get killed in a single hit even in the mid-game, just because an enemy happened to have a weapon with a really strong fusion. At the same time, there is a point where armor begins to outscale most basic weapons. In the late game, almost all enemy attacks deal only minimal damage, because after a while our armor is just so powerful that enemies can't deal damage through it anymore. In between those two extremes, there is only a very small corridor where, you know, attacks deal an actually appropriate amount of damage, but the game barely ever plays out in between those two extremes. In the first half of the game, lots of combat encounters are so deadly that the enemies just kill us in one or two hits. In the late game, most enemies deal barely any damage at all. Okay, I know what at least one of you is currently thinking. Okay, Seath, I get it. The healing is a problem and the damage is really scaled in a bit of a train wrecky way, but why would having more hearts make the game harder? Well, thank you so much for asking. See, the game has a system in place to prevent enemies from killing us with a single hit if we have full health. If we have four hearts, for example, and an enemy deals 10 hearts of damage, then the game will not allow the attack to kill us from full health. It will leave us with a quarter heart instead. To the best of my knowledge, no attack in the game will ever kill us if we have full health. So what happens in the exact same situation if we have six hearts instead of only four? Well, we still end up with only a quarter of a heart after the attack. Attack. But now, 
we need to heal two more hearts to get our one-shot protection back. Upgrading our hearts in the early game doesn't make us survive more attacks, since most enemies one-shot us anyway until we get more armor. All that more health does is massively increase the amount of food we need to cook and consume, which brings us directly to the next problem of the game. Here's a quick anecdote of something that happened to me during my latest playthrough. Right before the final boss fight of the Gerudo Temple, I ran out of healing items, which meant that the boss killed me with every single hit. Because of this, the only way for me to beat the boss was to play the entire fight perfectly without ever getting hit. So killing a boss in a Zelda game without getting hit isn't a terribly difficult task, but you know, it's still a bit of a big ask for the very first kill. But that's not even the story yet, see? It only took me about 10 tries and I already had the boss almost down. But then I got a bit too greedy and ended up in a situation where I wasn't able to dodge his attack anymore. So I opened up the menu and... I started to eat apples like crazy. I ate apples like I never ate apples before. While I was out of cooked food, I still had ingredients. I ate apples until I had full health again. Funnily enough, the boss ended up missing me here and I still don't know why. But as the old saying goes, an apple a day keeps the Gerudo boss at bay. But that's actually not the end of the anecdote, because after this little disaster, I decided to finally take the time to cook up all of my food items that I had stored up to prevent something like this from happening again. Cooking up all my items took me over 10 minutes. It took me over 10 minutes to cook meals because the cooking system is so incredibly slow. On the one hand, Tears of the Kingdom has a combat system where food makes us pretty much invincible and on the other hand, cooking is an incredibly tedious and unnecessarily slow system. The healing is just a mess, the cooking is a mess, the damage scaling is all over the place. It's just, you know, it's a mess. Here's where this gets interesting. The 3D Zelda series was never known for its amazing combat. But the Zelda series also never had a problem with its healing system or with the damage scaling before it shifted to open world. The old Zelda games never used armor with different armor values and they never had us cook items to heal. Instead, enemy damage was just based on the enemy we fought and we healed by picking up hearts that the enemies dropped after defeating them. And you know, that just worked. So Breath of the Wild was the first Zelda game to go open world and you know, it's an incredibly ambitious game. It is to expect that some systems like the damage scaling or the healing break when shaking up the formula so much. It's the one thing that Breath of the Wild tried something new and it failed. But Tears of the Kingdom is a sequel, yet it doesn't even try to fix those flaws. Flaws that no Zelda game had before. What baffles me so much is that I believe simply using a system similar to the old games would have solved most problems. The different armors in the game and the different foods all already have tons of interesting side effects apart from healing. If they were to just, you know, add a bunch more of those effects, then I believe they could completely remove the healing aspect of food and the armor value of armor without making those systems obsolete, but it would allow them to use a healing and damage system like in the old games. And I believe that would fix most of the game's combat problems. Would such a system be truly better? Well, I have no idea. Those are incredibly complex problems that can't be solved in a YouTube video. But that's not actually the point. The point is that the Zelda games never had this problem before Breath of the Wild. But instead of, you know, drawing inspiration of how the old games avoided this problem for Breath's sequel, they simply replicated Breath of the Wild's problems. So we'll leave it at that for the moment because we'll circle back to this at the end of the video. But before we wrap up our discussion of Tears of the Kingdom's combat system, we quickly have to chat about one more completely unrelated thing because it bothers me. One tiny thing, a nitpick really, but something that I just can't wrap my head around. The shield parry. The shield parry is completely useless. Look, usually when a game features a dodge and a parry option, and the dodge option is a low risk, low reward action, and the parry option is a high risk, high reward action. You know, if we mess up a dodge, we might still avoid damage. But if we mess up a shield parry, we'll get hit straight in the face. Because of this, a parry is usually more rewarding than a dodge. In Tears of the Kingdom, however, this is not the case. Here, parrying is actually a high risk, low reward action, and the dodge is a low risk, high reward move. A shield parry breaks the enemy's guard and gives us a second to attack if successful. A dodge, however, has the chance to trigger a flurry rush, which is a way better reward. Why would anyone ever use the shield parry if the less riskier option is also the more rewarding one? The shield parry's entire design is backwards. It's not a huge problem or anything, it's just, 
you know, so weird. But let's move on. Let's pay the Gorons a visit. Since we last met them, the Gorons of Death Mountain have developed a serious addiction problem. A new kind of delicious stone is causing the local Gorons a lot of troubles. To make matters worse, the local chief of the mining company, Yunovo, has apparently gone rogue. Since he started wearing a mask that Zelda gifted him, he goes so far to attack us once we confront him about this and we have to defeat him in a boss fight. Once defeated, the mask is off and Yunovo is suddenly friendly again. Together with him, we head to the top of Death Mountain. There, we defeat another boss while flying on a glider, which is surprisingly epic and actually ended up being one of the highlights of the game for me, before diving deep into Death Mountain, into the depths where an ancient Gorn city is hidden. This city is the third dungeon, and once again, it's mediocre. The whole dungeon plays around with the minecarts, but since we were able to climb and glide, most people probably end up ignoring the minecarts at some point. The final puzzle here is also unnecessarily tedious. We have to build a bridge for Unobo to roll over, which just takes forever, but more on this in a second. After defeating the temple's boss, who ended up being my least favorite of the bunch, hitting him with Unobo is just so awkward during the second phase, we finally learn about the secret stones and the demon king for the first time, for the third time. Secret stone? Demon King? And then it is time for us to finally head towards the desert. But first, we have to discuss something else. Something entirely different. See, after finishing this dungeon, I continued to explore Death Mountain for a bit. And while exploring there, this happened. I wanted to use Ultra Hand on a couple of things. But instead of using Ultra Hand, I threw away my weapon by accident. Let that sink in for a moment. At this point, we are halfway through the game. We have already beaten three dungeons. My playtime at this point is probably clocking in at over 40 hours. Yet there I was, still throwing away my sword like an idiot. I was still struggling with the game's controls, halfway from my playthrough. As a matter of fact, even after beating the game and exploring its world for another countless hours, I still haven't fully adjusted to the game's controls. I still sometimes open up my weapon storage when I want to switch my arm power. I still sometimes open up the shield menu when I want to change my weapon. And I still sometimes throw away my weapon when I want to use Ultra Hand. Why? Like literally, what is going on with the controls in Tears of the Kingdom that makes it so hard to adjust to them? Well, gentle ladies and gentlemen, let's put on our detective hats and let's fire on the pipe of investigation. We got a case to crack. The case on our hand is a really interesting one. Somewhere in the control scheme of Tears of the Kingdom, there's a problem hidden that causes me to press throw when I actually want to use Ultra Hand. But what is the best place to start our little investigation? Well, what better place than first to get an overview over the evidence? Let's start by discussing eight different problems of Tears of the Kingdom's user interface. And let's find out if one of them is causing the weapon throwing problem. The run button is mapped to the B button, while the jumping button is mapped to the X button. Those two buttons are opposite to each other. Because of this, it is not possible to press run and jump at the same time with just a thump. Run and jump are obviously actions that we want to perform at the same time, but can't press at the same time. There are three different buttons for skipping something. The plus button skips cutscenes. Sometimes. Sometimes, however, it is the X button that skips them. To make matters even worse, it is neither X nor plus that skips text, but the B button, meaning that skipping text and skipping cutscenes is mapped to three different buttons. It is not possible to cycle through the enemies when we use the lock-on feature. Once we press the ZL button and it locks onto an enemy, we can't change it. It is sometimes surprisingly difficult to change our lock-on target if we happen to disagree with the game about which moblin to beat up first. The cooking menu is atrocious. It takes forever to cook up a bunch of elixirs or healing items, since we always have to go into the menu, choose our ingredients there, only to then leave the menu and cook the items in the overworld in a cutscene instead of, you know, just cooking them in the menu. We always leave the bow aiming mode as soon as we fire an arrow. That is usually not a big problem, but when we want to fire a bunch of fused arrows while locked on, that means that we always first have to fuse an item, then aim, then pull out the bow again, only to fuse a new item, only to aim again, and so on. Speaking of fusing, I'd love to call the quick menu item selection that is used to drop items into the world a train wreck, but this honestly seems insulting to train wrecks to me. Let's put it this way. It is much slower to pick an item via the quick menu than it is to just open up the normal slow menu and to pick the item there. If the quick menu is slower to use than the slow menu, well then the quick menu isn't that good at doing the quick part. 
Fusing has even another UI problem. The game doesn't allow to fuse items directly in the menu. Instead, we always have to drop the item into the overworld first and are only there allowed to fuse. This is a really weird and unnecessary extra step that makes fusing something really tedious. Finally, the Sage abilities are used by walking to the Sages first and talking there with them. This is not that bad when we just want to use an ability for a puzzle, but it is completely impractical to use while in combat. That's a real pity because all the abilities would be incredibly cool and useful during combat, but it's just close to impossible to use them there. Alright, so what have we learned so far that helps us find out why we throw away our weapon by accident? Well, nothing, but at least we're now able to rule out the first bunch of suspects. What is the next logical place to look if we truly want to crack our case? Well, maybe the answer to a burning question isn't hidden in Tears of the Kingdom to begin with. Maybe we're only able to crack our case if we start to look for clues elsewhere. Maybe we should leave Hyrule for a moment and visit a different, legendary kingdom. Demon's Souls is a game that on the surface shares a lot of features with Tears of the Kingdom. Both games feature sword play, a defensive dodge option, shields, shield parries, running with stamina, target locking, the camera behaves similarly and even the fighting systems are comparable. On the surface, the user experience in both games is very similar. But that's just the surface level. Because if we start to dig deeper, we can see that there's something weird going on with one of those two games. Let's take a look at how Demon Souls buttons are mapped. The game features a weak but fast attack and a stronger but slow attack. The fast attack is mapped to the upper right shoulder button. The riskier strong attack is mapped to the lower right shoulder button. Next we have a low risk defensive option raising our shield to block attacks. This one is mapped to the upper left shoulder button. Finally, we have a button to parry. Parrying is a high risk, high reward defensive move and it is mapped to the lower left shoulder button. Hooray! There are like a million other functions in the game but those aren't important for us so let's collectively pretend they don't exist. Poof, there they go. So here's the thing with this control scheme. It's incredibly good. I barely ever saw anyone talk about the controls of Demon's Souls or the Souls games in general, which is a huge compliment. Great controls are usually invisible. If no one has anything to say about the controls of a game, it usually means the devs nailed it. Okay, so where is all of this headed? Well, one of the main reasons why those controls feel so intuitive to use is, at least in my humble opinion, because they make clever use of something that I'd like to call aerial and directional associations. So what the heck are aerial associations? Well, it's certain areas on the controller that are associated with certain actions. Let's take the attacking action as an example. Both attack options are mapped to the right shoulder buttons. This means that the right side of the controller is associated with attack Hacking as a whole. The left side is the opposite. This side is the defensive or the shield area. Both defensive shield moves are mapped to buttons on this side, which means that this part of the controller is associated with defense in general. That's just a small thing that helps our korok shaped brains to intuitively get the controls. If we think attack in the heat of a battle, we intuitively know that attacking is on the right side. If we think shield, we know that shield is on the left. Cool. Nothing revolutionary so far, just clever button mapping. But it gets even better because the buttons are not only associated with a single area, but with a second one as well. The area where the upper and smaller buttons are is associated with the actions that are quick and of low risk, the fast attack and raising a shield. The lower and bigger shoulder buttons, however, are both in an area that is associated with slower and more risky moves, the strong attack and the parry. This further helps to intuitively get the controls. Again, that's nothing revolutionary, just a clever, well thought out control scheme that most people intuitively understand. Cool. With all this evidence taken care of, let's finally crack our case and let's figure out why we so often press throw when we want to use Ultra Hand. There are three important aerial mappings in Tears of the Kingdom that separate the controls. There is a choose something area that spans from the left directional buttons where we swap weapons and shields up to the hand power button where we choose our hand powers. Next, there is an aim abilities area that spawns over the four shoulder buttons. All four of those buttons do something loosely related to aiming. Be it aiming with ultra hand, be it throwing a weapon, be it shooting an arrow or locking onto an enemy. Finally, there is a do something area that features the most basic abilities that Link can use. Running, attacking, jumping, picking something up and using a hand power. This one spans from the right side of the controller to the upper left shoulder button where we activate our arm powers. Choosing something is generally associated more with the left side of the controller and using something generally more with the right one. 
and that's our culprit right here. That's the first big problem with Tears of the Kingdom's user interface. The hand power button is part of all three aerial mappings because the button is associated with aiming, using and choosing at once. So if we want to use an aim ability, like for example use Ultra Hand, then the intuitive area for this button would be the upper right. But it isn't there. There is the throw a weapon button. And this, ladies and gentlemen, gives us the first part of the answer to the question why it is so tempting to throw away a weapon when we actually want to use Ultra Hand. It's because the upper right shoulder button is the logical place to map this ability to. But it isn't there. Throwing a weapon is. Instead, it is placed on the left side, the side strongly associated with choosing something. Whoops. So there is an obvious fix to this little mishap. Just split choose a hand ability and use a hand ability into two different buttons. Using a hand power swaps places with throwing a weapon, choosing a hand power replaces the horse whistle button and the horse whistle button, I'm honestly, I don't care. The horse whistle button gets to make a nice little holiday somewhere outside the normal control scheme like on the beautiful special items menu island where it belongs to, to begin with. If we were to simply apply those small changes to the button mapping on the controller, the aerial associations would suddenly look like this. Much more intuitive, isn't it? But we've just been scratching the surface of the aerial association problem with the button mapping in Tears of the Kingdom so far, because there is a second, different area that is associated with certain actions. And that's the three cross-shaped button layouts that exist. Those are first the four cross-shaped buttons loosely associated with using something. A, B, X and Y. Second, the four cross-shaped buttons associated with choosing something. And finally, it's the four main directions in the circle menu, where we choose our hand powers. That's three different areas that are part of the main user interface that all feature four directions, up, down, left and right. So here's the thing. The same way it makes sense to associate certain areas on the controller with certain actions, the same way it makes sense to associate certain directions with similar actions. You know, if attacking is on the left, for example, then it just makes sense to map choosing a different weapon to attack with also onto the left side. If the using is mapped down, then it makes sense that we also use the down button in another menu if we want to fuse an arrow, for example, and so on. It's pretty basic stuff. Except pretty much everything is all over the place if we view Tears of the Kingdom through this lens. Like, completely, completely. It's an insane mess. Here we go. The button to attack with a weapon is Y, and therefore associated with the direction left. But the direction to choose a weapon is on the right. Fusing is placed down on the wheel menu, and therefore associated with the direction down. But fusing something to a weapon is the Y button, which is associated with attacking. Therefore fusing is associated with two different directions, is what I would say if it were, but it ain't. If we want to fuse something onto an arrow, we have to do it with the item quick select menu, which is the direction up. So choosing to fuse is down, activating fuse is an area associated with aiming, using fuse in the world is left, fusing an arrow is up, I hope you're taking notes, don't forget that fusing something onto a shield is set L. Swapping the shield is associated with the left side. The shield parry, however, is mapped to the A button while holding set L. A is on the right, so using the shield parry is on the right, but using the shield is on the left. Do you start to see how how messy the whole thing is? Choosing Ultra Hand is pressing a button that is associated with aiming first and then choosing something on the right. Half the time when I want to use Ultra Hand however, I end up pressing a button that is associated with choosing something and is on the right, namely choose a weapon. And we haven't even talked about the worst problem yet, pulling out an item and fusing it to a weapon. This is the following input sequence. First up on the left side of the controller, then we have to navigate for an endless list of items. The X button is drop something here, the button associated with jump. If we want to sort the menu, it's Y, a button associated with attacking. Then we have to pick the weapon we want to fuse with, which means pressing right. The direction associated with the accept something function and the shield. Next we choose the weapon and then have to open up the fuse menu by pressing a button associated with aiming and choose fuse by picking it by choosing down, a direction associated with cancelling and running. Next we have to hit a button on the upper left side associated with aim and choosing to activate our ability and would you believe it? All that is left to do is now push Y, a button on the left associated with attacking in a direction also associated with shields and finally our spear is ready to use. 
who certainly not Ray. I hope no one got a headache by talking this through. It's up, up, L, down, right, L and left. That's the input sequence of a complex monster hunter combo. And that is before taking the messed up aerial associations into consideration. So when I want to use ultra hand, my brain does something like, it's an aim function, which is on the shoulder buttons. And it's a do something function, which is on the right side. And there goes my sword. I hope it enjoys its holiday at the bottom of the canyon. Turns out using a hand ability is mapped to the area associated with choosing. Whoops. But the weirdest thing about all of this is how easy a lot of this is to fix. So many problems can be solved by remapping a couple of buttons. If we swap the choose a weapon button with the choose a shield button and swap the placement of use and rewind, most of the paradoxical directional mapping would be solved on whim. That's like, a really, really small change. If we were to add the changes to the layout we discussed previously, we would immediately have solved most paradoxical aerial associations with the control scheme. So would this be a perfect menu system? Well, honestly, no. It fixes a lot of the confusion that arises because of paradoxical aerial associations. And it's how I personally would have preferred to play the game, but it would be far from perfect, which brings us to a simple truth. A simple truth that we just have to accept. A game like Tears of the Kingdom is so complex and has so, so many different functions and systems that it's simply not possible to create a perfect menuing system. There are so many different situations where a different button layout would be optimal. You know, the best layout for, say, solving a puzzle in a shrine probably features most of our magical hand abilities on a button. But the perfect layout for, say, fighting a tough enemy probably features two different buttons for weapons, a sage ability, and another button for a wand all on its own. It's just not possible. I mean, it's not like it's possible to have buttons that people can program while they're playing the game, like just reprogram the control when in a shrine versus combat or whatever. 37 years ago, Shigeru Miyamoto and his team at Nintendo were confronted with a seemingly unsolvable problem. They had this dream of creating a game where a hero would go into a grand adventure, a game where this hero has to overcome overwhelming odds while exploring a huge world, a game where this hero could solve puzzles using bombs, magical rods, a candle or a boomerang, while also being able to fight with a sword, a shield or by shooting arrows. The game I'm talking about is obviously 1987's original The Legend of Zelda, the game that started the whole series. So why were our young and ambitious game developers confronted with a seemingly unsolvable problem, you might ask? Well, this is what an NES controller looks like. If we subtract the start and select button, the controller features exactly two buttons. A and B. How should the team create a game where it is possible to throw bombs, to shoot arrows, to fight with the sword and to raise a shield all at once when they had only two buttons to work with? Luckily, they came up with a brilliant solution. They made the two buttons programmable for the player on the fly. In the original Zelda, players are able to reprogram the buttons themselves while playing. All that they need to do is to open up the pause menu, choose the item they want to map and reprogram it there on the fly. This little feature suddenly made it possible to have as many different items in the game as the developers wished for. Players could fight with sword and shield in one moment only to use something completely different the next. The concept of reprogramming buttons was a huge success. In fact, every single Zelda game used a similar system going forward. Every Zelda game, until Link stepped onto the Great Plateau for the very first time. Weirdly enough, they dropped this menuing solution with Breath of the Wild. So here's the weird thing. The longer I think about the traditional Zelda menuing, the more I start to believe that the traditional menuing would have been a perfect fit for Tears of the Kingdom, much better than what we got. Here's a quick draft of how the button mapping could have worked if they were to go with a more traditional approach. So first things first, running stays on the B button, but jumping swaps places with the pick up button and is now on A. We simply add an option to swap them back for everyone who prefers the previous layout. The lock on stays on the ZL button, stealth stays on pressing in the left stick, the camera and the scope get fused into one function and stay on the right stick, cool. So here's where this gets interesting. The Y button now becomes the use selected button and the four directional buttons to the left and the upper two shoulder buttons become reprogrammable buttons for weapons, items, rune powers and even follower abilities. So how do we set those buttons? Well, by simply pressing the button we want an item to be on while in the menu. If we press the button now during normal gameplay, the item hops onto Y and we can use it there. A system like this has, at least in my humble onion, six major benefits over the system currently in place. 
First, it allows us to have several weapons out at once, meaning if we want to quickly shoot, say, a fireball to set an enemy on fire and encounter with a spear, we can suddenly have both items out at once and just need to change between them with the press of a button. Second, if we are in a shrine that requires several different rune abilities like Ascend, Return, Time and Ultra Hand, well, then we can just put the three different abilities on three different buttons while we're in the shrine and don't have to change them all the time. Third, it makes it much easier to use single items. If we, for example, explore the depths and know we're going to need tons of bright seeds, then we can just map them onto a button for the duration we're down there and are suddenly able to throw light sources with the press of a button. Fourth, it solves the tedium of using different items onto arrows. Currently, we have to manually choose the item we want to put onto an arrow every single time in the menu. With a more traditional Zelda menu, we could just fuse the item onto the arrow by quickly pressing the button it is mapped to while we're aiming. That would especially help if we want to do fusion combos, like first fire something that freezes the enemy and then set it on fire with the second arrow, or something like that. Fifth, if the Sage abilities were mapped onto specific buttons that we can program ourselves and the abilities become like a million times more useful in an instant, especially in combat. Sixth and finally, it would make the one use only items a lot more useful for fusing. Fusing something like an elemental choo-choo onto a sword currently just doesn't make sense since fusing is so tedious, but an elemental choo-choo only lasts for a single strike. If we could fuse things by just quickly tapping our fuse button and then tapping the item we want to put onto our weapon, it would be much quicker and would actually make it viable to put something onto our sword for each single strike during combat. Cool. But there is one more thing. The set R button is still not in use in our fictional user interface. What do we program onto this one? Well, honestly, I think the best idea would be to make it a contextual button that changes what we can program onto the other six. Like left is an item and set R plus left at the same time is another one. That would allow us to map 12 different items, abilities, weapons or sage powers onto a controller all at once. So is this a perfect system? Hell no, obviously not. It's not possible to craft an alternative menuing system just on paper. That's not a problem that can be solved in a YouTube video. A user interface needs to be tested by users and it needs tweaking until everything works. We can't come up with something that works just by thinking about it long and hard enough. But that's not the goal here. The goal is something different. It is simply to show that it theoretically would have been possible to build a menuing system for Tears of the Kingdom that is much more in line with traditional Zelda games. A menuing system that uses reprogrammable buttons like all the old Zelda games do. A system that I believe would have turned out way better than the mess that is currently in the game. And this is where we were heading the whole time. Because this gentle ladies and gentlemen is a really interesting question. Why did Nintendo opt for a system like this with Breath of the Wild? And even more importantly, why did they reuse it for Tears of the Kingdom? So, spoiler alert, but the answer to this question is where this entire video is heading to, and the answer to this question is the real reason why we so often throw away our weapon when we actually want to use Ultra Hand. That's right, we arrested the wrong guy previously. Sadly, we can't fix this mistake right now because we still need to lay a bit of groundwork first. So I'm sorry, but we'll have to leave this as a cliffhanger for now. We'll circle back to those questions once we reach the conclusion. Big rainbow fuzzy swear. All right, so how are the Gerudo doing? Their town is overrun by undead, the desert is plagued by a storm and they are hiding underground. Well, that's a pity to hear. Good thing we are here to change things. The sage in this area is Ryu. She is able to cause lightning strikes at areas we mark with our arrows first. Together with her, we fight off an attack on the Gerudo town before solving a puzzle in the desert involving guiding light beams around. Once the puzzle is solved, we are able to strike a newly appeared structure with lightning, which in consequence reveals the fourth temple to us. So this temple is actually my favorite one in the game. While it isn't exceptionally great or anything, it has one thing that the other dungeons so desperately need. It has a bit of a theming. When we enter the dungeon, it feels as if we're really entering a real forgotten grave. There are hidden burial chambers. There are forgotten burial gifts. There are traps that we trigger and so on. The whole dungeon is just so much better contextualized than the others. This little bit of contextualizing goes such a long way to make the dungeon feel like a real place. It's crazy. Crazy. Anyway, we beat the boss here, in part, but not only, thanks to digesting an unhealthy amount of apples and learn about the secret stones and the Demon King. For the first time. For the fourth time. Demon King? Secret Stone? I only ever beat Breath of the Wild 
once, during my very first playthrough. I've done many more playthroughs afterwards, but I never cared about the main story anymore. In my opinion, Breath of the Wild is a game that is at its strongest during its first 20 to 30 hours of runtime. The longer the game goes on, the more its systems start to crack until they break entirely. You know, while the weapon durability doesn't really matter during the early game, it starts to make me avoid combat towards the late game. While killing enemies in creative ways is a ton of fun in the early game, it becomes basically impossible to do once the enemies become gigantic bullet sponges that a bomb explosion is merely tingling. While engaging with the cooking system is fun at the beginning of the game, it becomes more and more tedious the more resources we stock up, and so on. Breath of the Wild just kind of peaks around hour 15 or so for me. And you know, that's okay. See, the way I ended up enjoying Breath of the Wild after its release was the following. I'd usually boot up a new save, make my way through the Great Plateau and then, well, then I'd just run into whatever direction I felt like. Maybe I'd head to Death Mountain, do the Goron quest, complete the shrines along the way, explore a bit in this area, do Eventide and then, well, then I maybe had enough of the game for a while and I'd stop playing. And the next time when I started a playthrough, I'd just run into a completely different direction. Playing the game like this basically allowed me to experience most of the content while the game's systems were at its peak. And it allowed me to avoid all the problems that pop up the longer the game runs. And I was looking forward to replaying Tears of the Kingdom in a similar way. But... Tears of the Kingdom is not very replayable, and this is mainly because of a series of baffling decisions that unnecessarily harm replayability. As an example, it takes hours of gameplay just to get all our basic abilities unlocked. Whenever we want to replay the game, we have to first beat the Great Sky Island, which, you know, is fine. But afterwards, we also have to head to Lookout Landing and talk to a bunch of people there, head to Hyrule Castle, head back to Lookout Landing, and only then we unlock the Paraglider. The game is close to unplayable without the paraglider. But at this point, we still lack a bunch of essential features. We also have to unlock the camera by doing a side quest in the depths. We also have to visit the depths below the Great Plateau and fight a boss fight to unlock the auto build feature. And if we want to explore in whatever direction we want to go, it really wouldn't hurt to unlock a great fairy or two as well, which is another really slow and boring side quest. Tears of the Kingdom is a game with an insane amount of content. It's a game with so much content that I didn't even attempt to see all of it on my first playthrough. Tears of the Kingdom would be the perfect perfect game to replay for decades to come. But Tears of the Kingdom is also a game that makes it unnecessarily tedious to replay it. Which is where we were heading, because, well, because it is not only replaying the game that is unnecessarily tedious. There are tons of different things in Tears of the Kingdom that are tedious for no apparent reason. The cooking system is too slow and tedious. Talking to the sign guy often takes longer than solving the sign puzzle itself. Sometimes NPCs call us out for taking an item of theirs, which would be fun if it wouldn't completely pause the game for half a minute. The texts that some sometimes appear in shrines, can't be sped up and take forever before fading away. The cutscene that plays whenever we upgrade our heart pieces is slow and starts to drag after a while, but it can't be skipped. There's always a slow cutscene when we upgrade our weapon stash using Korok seeds. This one can be skipped, but it still makes getting a lot of upgrades at once tedious. Entering and leaving a shrine features four separate cutscenes that we have to skip separately every time. Korok seeds popping up always breaks the flow of gameplay. Like. I'm serious, finding a Korok seed takes about 6 seconds, depending on how fast we can mash the skip button. Just think about this, there are 1000 Korok seeds in the game and finding one takes 6 seconds every time. If you were to find all of them, that means that we watched 6 1000 seconds of Korok cutscenes. 6000 seconds are one and a half hours. Using items is tedious, mainly because of the horrible UI. Opening a chest is slow, especially since the rewards are either useless or we lack inventory space to use them. I honestly stopped opening the chests that like likes drop towards the end of my playthrough. The cutscene when activating a Skyview Tower can't be skipped for whatever reason, so we have to watch it 14 times. Carrying the lost Korok to his body becomes tedious by the third time we do it. So tedious, as a matter of fact, that I ended up skipping the quest altogether after a while. The shops are slow and tedious to interact with, which is doubly strange because there is a perfectly fine shop system in place. The beetle guy. All dungeons feature basically the same cutscene after beating the dungeon. And we haven't even talked about the worst of Bender yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think anything in any game I've ever played has shown so little respect to my time. Then Tears of the Kingdoms. Rock Walls. 
Holy fuzzy, those cursed things. Most caves in this game are plastered with gigantic stone walls that are a nightmare to destroy. They're often so large that it takes several weapons just to make it through one of them. Some are so large that it takes upwards of a dozen bomb arrows to destroy them, which we just can't afford since arrows and bombs are both a scarce and important resource. In theory, Unibo's bomb charge would solve this problem, but he takes so long to recharge while his explosion only destroys such a tiny fraction of the rock that he ends up being useless as well. I'm not even kidding, those walls are a serious problem. They are tedious enough that they caused me to avoid exploring caves altogether after visiting about 50 caves. The first thing I did after getting the Master Sword was to fuse a freaking rock onto it, because with this I finally had a recharging rock hammer. Take this Ganondorf, your tedious rocks aren't going to stop me, for I have fused the stone onto the legendary sword of the ancient hero. All of those problems wouldn't be a deal breaker by any means on their own, but when combined they make playing the game unnecessarily tedious. And we haven't even talked about the elephant in the room yet. We haven't talked about the physics engine and the modular vehicle building. Look. Tears of the Kingdom's physic engine is incredible. It is a technical marvel that those physics are running. But they are not only running, they are incredibly polished and almost bug-free. Nintendo really outdid themselves with this physics engine. It's just, the longer I think about the physics engine, the more I come to believe that, well, that complicated vehicle building physics aren't the best fit for a puzzle game. I think it's impossible to objectively measure if a puzzle is good or bad. There are so many variables at play and so much of it is subjective, debating whether a puzzle is objectively good or bad is just a stupid thing to attempt. However, there is one thing that I think can be objectively measured when it comes to puzzles in video games. One thing that is actually useful when comparing the puzzle design of different games. Something that I'd like to call the execution delay score. So what is the execution delay score, you might ask? Well, it's the time it takes us to execute the solution of a puzzle after we figured out how to solve it. Here's an example. In our previous video, we discussed the Resident Evil 4 remake and we chatted about how Capcom designed all the puzzles in the game to be quickly solvable once we know the solution, to help with replayability. Well, let's take a look at the execution delay for one of the puzzles in Resident Evil 4. In this cave, we have to find three symbols that are painted onto the walls. Afterwards, we have to enter those three symbols at this pedestal. So correctly identifying the three symbols and realizing that we have to enter them here is the puzzle. Once we got all of this, we actually solved the puzzle. The execution delay is now how long it takes us to actually enter the solution so that the game knows that we actually solved it. And it took me about six seconds during my latest playthrough. Hooray! The execution delay for this puzzle is six seconds. And I'd say that's pretty good. Generally, everything below 20 seconds seems reasonable to me. If it takes significantly longer, however, well then solving the puzzle becomes tedious, which brings us back to Tears of the Kingdom. Take a look at this shrine. Here we have four balls that we have to put into the correct terminal hole. The problem we face is that we have significantly more holes than we have balls. Don't quote me on that. So we have to find out which four holes the balls are supposed to go into. The solution is to realize that there is a marking above the correct hole hidden at the ceiling. That's a cool puzzle. Here's the moment I realized the solution. Here's the moment the puzzle is actually solved in game. In between, well, in between, 55 seconds passed. It took me almost a minute to execute the solution. That's an execution delay of 55 seconds. It took me longer to execute the puzzle than it took me to solve it, which isn't optimal. Just to be clear here, the puzzle above is fine and it's not a huge problem to have a puzzle every once in a while that takes a bit longer to execute. If this becomes the norm, however, if every puzzle takes this long, well, then it becomes a problem. And a problem it became. We have to chat about what happened to me in the spirit temple. So, turns out there aren't just four sages in Tears of the Kingdom, there is actually a secret fifth one. In order to figure out where to find him, we first have to investigate the ruins in Kakariko, which starts a scavenger hunt that first leads us to a beautiful jungle river, where we have to follow a couple of clues that afterwards brings us to another huge sky island. This semi-linear sky island is as great as all the others are. After making our way through it, we unlock a new chasm to the depths and down there, in the depths, the spirit temple awaits us. The spirit temple broke me. A part of me died down there. 
When I left it, I wasn't able to enjoy the game as much as I did before, anymore. Our goal in the Spirit Temple is it to bring four different blocks to the area in the center in order to build the Sage, a new robotic self. One of the puzzles here requires us to build a vehicle that makes it possible for this block to drive over this electrical pole. And this is the exact puzzle where disaster struck. How to solve this puzzle? Well, one solution is just to add wheels in a pyramid-shaped form to the bottom of the block and to have it drive over the pole that way. It took me almost exactly three minutes from the moment I realized this to the moment until I finally had gathered all the building blocks and had built my construct. It took me three whole minutes just to execute the solution I already had formed in my head. And then this happened. I was standing on the moving vehicle, which shifted its central point of mass around and caused it to fall off. I spent three minutes building the solution only for it to fall off because I'm an idiot. So I ended up rebuilding the entire thing just to make sure that it doesn't fall off again. In the end, executing the solution to this puzzle took me a little over five minutes. The execution delay for this puzzle ended up being almost five minutes. Just as a comparison, it is possible to input the solution to Resident Evil 4's cave over 50 times before I executed the solution to this puzzle once. Something died inside of me when this happened. I didn't care about the puzzle in the next room anymore. I just immediately cheesed it. I stopped to care about all the puzzles that require me to build a construct. I started to cheese almost every shrine with the ultra hand recall combo. I just stopped to care about most of the puzzles. I stopped caring about the puzzles in a Zelda game because executing the solution was often so tedious, I didn't want to do it anymore. So was my solution to the puzzle above a bit dumb well, yeah it was. After thinking about it for a bit, there are certainly better ways to solve this puzzle. Ways that take, say, only a minute to execute. But you know, in a game the size of Tears of the Kingdom, everyone will sooner or later attempt to solve a puzzle in a non-optimal way, leading to similar experiences. And I think that's a real problem. The huge problem here is that building constructs and vehicles out of different building parts well, it just takes a while. It's not even that the building system is realized in a bad way. It's just an unavoidable problem. Building stuff all by ourselves just takes a while. But mechanics that take a while usually aren't the best fit for a puzzle game. You know, if my first idea on how to solve a puzzle is wrong, that's no problem. But if it took me two minutes to build this wrong solution, then it suddenly becomes a problem. Just to be clear here, the physics in Tears of the Kingdom are incredible. They're really beyond anything I've ever seen in a game. It's just that I don't think complicated vehicle building mechanics are the best fit for a puzzle game, like Zelda, because such mechanics tend to be very slow to execute. We're almost done with our discussion of tedious game mechanics in Tears of the Kingdom. There's just one more thing. Actually, it's not even a thing, it's a nitpick, but it's a nitpick that says so much about the game that we're going to pick it up anyway. The thing is the following. After we've found all the mech parts, we're finally able to finish the fifth Sage robot thing and are rewarded with a rideable and customizable mech. The final Sage is a vehicle that we can ride ourselves. We're able to fuse something onto both of its arms separately and we're even able to fuse a gadget onto the mech. Back. So if this does sound awesome, well then I have bad news for you. Because Nintendo designed the gameplay section after getting the mech in such a way that pretty much ensures everyone is going to hate this thing five minutes after getting it. So check this out. Directly after getting the mech, there is a small construction site where the game teaches us how to fuse different items onto the mech's arm, you know? We get to put a spiked ball onto one arm and, I don't know, something like a flamethrower onto our other hand. which is objectively awesome. Directly behind this construction site, Nintendo placed a small enemy camp. That's really clever, you know? We just got this new cool mech, we just customized it with a powerful spiked weapon, a flamethrower. This enemy camp is Nintendo telling us to just go wild and to murder those poor bokoblins with our new mega mech. Show them who's boss, go wild, live out our power fantasies. They placed the camp here as a way for us to experience our newfound power. There's just a tiny problem. The mech isn't able to defeat the enemies. It's too weak. As a matter of fact, I died here on my first playthrough. I wasn't even able to get the enemies to half health. The mech's damage output is just too low. Nintendo gave us a new tool with the mech and then they put an enemy camp behind it, which the mech isn't able to defeat. I honestly don't know what to say about this. This enemy camp made me immediately hate the mech. Like, 
Nintendo, did the Mac do something bad to you during development or anything? Are they actively trying to make us dislike it? Tears of the Kingdom is tedious sometimes. It is filled with lots of strange decisions. Decisions that work against what it is trying to do. And its puzzles are all built on a core mechanic that by design makes it slow to execute puzzles. You know, this Mac section is such a great metaphor for so much in Tears of the Kingdom, because sometimes it feels as if the game's systems were fighting against each other. Anyway, we managed to defeat the boss of the spirit temple nonetheless, and with this, there is only one last thing for us to do. We have to discuss the story, find the master sword, and head towards Hyrule Castle. At the center of Tears of the Kingdom story is a mystery. The mystery is where Zelda and the Master Sword disappear to after the opening. The game reveals this mystery in a really interesting way. There are 12 memories hidden all over Hyrule. Each one of those memories contains a small part of the story. Most people will probably encounter those in random order, which means everyone is going to experience the story a bit differently. Which is cool, you know, I like it. Most people will probably be a bit confused after seeing only two or three cutscenes and the more they explore or the more they'll understand what is going on. So what is going on? Well, at the end of the opening, Zelda and the Master Sword actually teleported together back through time. They traveled back to the time period where the founding of Hyrule took place. There, our princess met the Sonai King, Raru, and his queen, Sonia. Zelda learns that she carries the power of light and time in her, and that her stone is actually a secret stone containing power. Zelda learns that eating one of those secret stones would transform her into an immortal dragon, but doing so would also mean that she would lose all memories and everything that makes herself her, which is why it is forbidden. In this timeline, there is also a threat to the kingdom of Hyrule. The evil king of the Gerudo, Ganondorf, wants to rule the land and attacks the kingdom. King Raru, however, manages to fight off the attack, which causes Ganondorf to change his plans. He understands that he can't win by pure force and thus decides to outsmart the Sona instead. He pleads his loyalty to the king. Later, we see Princess Zelda and Sonia talk together at a quiet place, until Zelda suddenly pulls out a knife and tries to murder Sonia. So that's the first big plot twist. All the different regions that we held in the game so far were troubled because Zelda appeared and caused chaos in one way or another. This Zelda wasn't Zelda, however. It actually was Ganondorf in disguise. So pretty much everyone probably saw this plot twist coming from a mile away, so it's good that this isn't the only plot twist in the story. Even though Sonia and Zelda were able to see through Ganondorf's disguise here, he still manages to murder Sonia and to steal her secret stone. As a side note, does anyone know what the stones are called in Japanese? Secret stones is such a weird name that it makes me wonder if some plane crashed here during translation. Anyway, with the stone, Ganon is now much stronger. Raru, Zelda and the five sages try to defeat him, but they aren't strong enough to pull it off. All that Raru is able to do is to sacrifice himself in order to put the demon king into a thousand year long slumber. This is the exact state we find the demon king in at the beginning of the game. We ran into him the same moment his slumber ended. Okay, so those are the main beats of the story so far. And so far, this is a normal Zelda narrative. There isn't anything going on that makes this narrative stand out amongst all the other Zelda games. Luckily, the game has one final trick up his sleeves that really elevates the narrative as a whole. The mystery of the Master Sword. So where is the Master Sword? Well, to find this out, we have to talk to the Deku Tree. The Deku Tree still lives in the middle of the Lost Forest, which is pretty bad for us, because in Tears of the Kingdom, it is not possible to cross the Lost Forest without getting lost. It is, however, possible to make our way through the depths below the forest and to ascend from below right in front of the Deku Tree. Doing this starts the strongest sequence of events in the game. The quest tied to the Master Sword is marvelous and had me in awe the whole way through. It's really, really good. We ascend from the Earth only to find out that all the Koroks and the Deku Tree are paralyzed. After looking around for a bit, we notice that there is a chasm to the depths right in the middle of the Deku Tree. We descend down directly into the heart of the Deku Tree. No idea what awaits us at the bottom. We land and then we suddenly get attacked by the most horrible creature in the entire game. We get attacked by Gloomhands. So Gloomhands are no joke. 
Those things aren't designed to put up a fair fight. Those things are designed to kill us. They're incredibly dangerous killer machines and defeating them is really no easy task. I only managed to kill them by sending into the air and by using tons of flesh fruits and arrows from above. Once the gloom hands are gone, we're suddenly attacked by manifestation of Ganondorf himself. Once the phantom Ganondorf is defeated, we finally cure the Deku Tree. This whole sequence evokes such an incredible sense of wonder and mystery from the second we arrive in front of the paralyzed tree until we defeat Phantom Ganon. It's really wonderful. Like in a literal sense of the word. It's full of wonder. We never know what to expect. It's really great. And that's just the beginning. The Deku Tree reveals to us that he's able to sense the presence of the Master Sword high up in the sky. It's moving. He doesn't know what all of this means, but he marks the spot on our map. And at this spot, High up in the air, we find the light dragon, and in the middle of the light dragon's face, well there, we find the master sword. So what is the master sword doing on the dragon's nose, one might ask? Well, to answer this question, we have to return to Zelda's timeline. See, after imprisoning the Demon King, Zelda realized that her original timeline is the timeline where the Demon King reawakens, and that Link lacks the master sword in this timeline. She needs to find a way to send the Master Sword forward in time to Link, but there is no way to travel forward through time for her. No way other than eating her secret stone and becoming an immortal dragon. She plans to transform herself into an immortal dragon that flies over the skies of Hyrule for thousands of years until we finally pull out the Master Sword in our timeline. The reason why the Master Sword is on this dragon is because this dragon is Zelda. It's Zelda that sacrificed herself thousands of years earlier to get the sword to our timeline. The memories we visited earlier were actually the last tears that Zelda cried during her transition into a dragon. In my opinion, this is an incredible origin story for the Master Sword. It's so incredibly sad and melancholic. It's really great. And the game absolutely nails the moment when we finally get the sword as well. This is the ending of the cutscene that plays when we get the sword. I didn't alter the audio. Just take a look. Link accepts the sword in complete silence. That's such a strong moment. The game understands that story-wise, this isn't a moment to celebrate. The game has the restraint to hand us the master sword in a sorrowful moment instead of a celebrative one. It's incredible. Moments like this are when Tears of the Kingdom is at its best. It's moments like these where the game reaches heights that very few other games I've ever played have reached before. I honestly believe that Tears of the Kingdom deserves every single Game of the Year award it is going to win only for the many incredible moments like getting the Master Sword that it creates. The game is great, but at the same time the game is so incredibly flawed. Alright, all that's left to do for us is to take the Master Sword to the depths of Hyrule Castle and to slay the Demon King here. But before we actually do that, we have to do something else. I haven't forgotten our cliffhanger from before. We still have to solve our case and we still have to figure out the true reason why we always throw away our weapon. <laughs> the year is 2011. Maybe it is a rainy day. Aichi Onuma is sitting at his table, deeply in thought. Nintendo had just released Skyward Sword to great critical acclaim. The question is now, how to follow up this game. The Zelda team had tried to create huge open worlds before. Wind Waker had the huge open ocean to explore, but due to time constraints, they weren't able to completely fill it with all the ideas they had. Skyward Sword had the huge sky islands. But again, for whatever reason, Nintendo didn't manage to fully fill them with content as they had hoped. They had tried several times to have huge open worlds before, but each time they failed. This time, it was going to be different. This time, they were going to succeed in creating a huge and explorable world. This time, the whole design of the game 
will focus in this direction from the very beginning of development. And it was critical that they succeeded, because Nintendo was about to release a new console, the Wii U was about to succeed the Wii, and a great Zelda game in the second or third year of its lineup would certainly help the console to become a worldwide hit. Fast forward a couple of years. Aonuma and his team have been working on Breath of the Wild for years now, and the game is slowly coming together. Though. Slowly is the name of the game. Turns out crafting a gigantic open world filled with incredibly complex physics interactions is a lot of work. Who knew? To make matters even worse, the Wii U had failed Nintendo. The console never managed to reach the mainstream appeal of the Wii and already was on live support. Nintendo was forced to move releases that they had originally planned for the Wii U over to their next upcoming console. The Nintendo Switch. The success of the Nintendo Switch is of utmost importance for Nintendo. The whole company entirely depends on it. And so, one faithful day, Aonuma gets a request from the company board. And this is the moment where disaster struck. They were asked to port Breath of the Wild over to the Switch and to release it on both consoles at the same time, because Nintendo needed a high-profile release title for the launch of the Switch. Supporting so a game over from the Wii U to the Switch is really complicated. Not because of technical problems, the Switch can handle Wii U games just fine, it is a problem for another completely different reason. The Wii U features a gamepad that is a separate second touchscreen that the Switch lacks. Every feature that is currently mapped to the touchscreen suddenly needs to be accessible on the Switch as well. To make matters worse, all of this happens at a late point in development. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the real reason why we so often throw our sword into lava when we just want to take a picture of our camera. Breath of the Wild's menus were simply never planned for the Switch. They were always meant to be used with a second touchpad in hand. The Switch port forced them to scrap their intended control scheme late in development. So many of Breath of the Wild's weird UI and user experience decisions suddenly make sense if we assume that we were originally meant to play the game with a Wii U gamepad. It would be much faster to switch rune powers or weapons if this was done on the gamepad. It suddenly makes sense when Link pulls out every item when he cooks something. The idea was probably once that we would scroll through the ingredients on the gamepad and if we tap them then Link takes them out on the television. The camera was probably meant to be actually held at the screen physically as if we were to take a real picture which might be the reason why it is a different function than the beam setting function. And most importantly it explains why they didn't design Breath of the Wild around traditional Zelda controls because for the biggest part of the development, they thought players would have a second touchpad in hand, which obviously opens up an insane amount of design space. But since they had to cut all gamepad functions late in development, Breath of the Wild ended up having a bit of wonky controls already. And Tears of the Kingdom now iterated onto those already not optimally designed controls. Instead of evaluating all of the shaky menu systems of Breath of the Wild, they instead added on top of them. But not only did they add on top of them, they made things actively worse. They caused even more paradoxical aerial mappings than were already present in Breath of the Wild. They designed the fuse mechanic around menus that were designed 12 years ago with the Wii U gamepad in mind. They didn't really improve on the slow cooking menu that never was meant to be used like this. They didn't fix problems people already told them about six years ago, like that the jump and the run button are obviously awkwardly placed. They didn't streamline features like making the camera and the view the world tool one thing. They didn't fix small awkward decisions like having three buttons be skip something. They didn't question weird decisions that weren't necessary in the first place like dedicating an entire button to the horse whistle. They turned the sage powers that were mostly passive abilities in Breath of the Wild into activatable abilities without a real system on how to activate them. They reused the exact same quick menu that was probably once designed with the Wii U gamepad in mind. But now they want us to choose something out of dozens and dozens of options. It's such an insane amount of items that the menu simply breaks. They spent six years iterating onto Breath of the Wild's menus. Menus that were never good to begin with. They could have fixed the mess that happened to the controls by porting the game over. And not only did they have a chance to fix the problems, they also had a chance to implement the menu system that goes back to the roots of the series. And it's not only the controls that could have benefited by going back to the roots of the series. The combat system could have benefited of it. The armor system could have. The puzzle design could have improved by going back to the roots. The same is true for the healing system. The dungeons would probably have turned out better if they were to take inspiration 
from the games they made in the past, and so on. A lot of the problems of Breath of the Wild were problems that the series had already fixed in the past. Breath of the Wild is an incredibly ambitious game that broke a couple of things that used to work in the past with all its ambition. And that's fine, you know, that's what sequels are for. Nintendo had a choice when it came to Tears of the Kingdom. They could either look at how the Zelda series solved a lot of the problems of Breath of the Wild in the past and fix them accordingly, or, well, or they could double down on Breath of the Wild and move even further away from the series' roots, which is exactly what they did. Which leads us to the next question. What did they do exactly? The development of Breath of the Wild took six years. In those six years, they came up with a unique concept. They built a combat system from scratch. They built the entire world, built most assets like the enemies, the items, the NPCs, the animals, the fairies, the taluses, and whatnot. They built the entire physics engine. They polished the game up to a point where it launched almost bug-free. They developed the graphical style. They composed the music. They even had to port the game to the Switch during the middle of development. You know, in those six years, they built the entire game from scratch. But Tears of the Kingdom was also in development for six years. What exactly did they do in the six years that they developed Tears of the Kingdom? You know, most of the assets are reused, most of the armor is reused, the cooking materials are the same, the fairies are there, almost all enemies reappear. We visit similar places where we talk to the same NPCs, it uses the same combat system, it uses the same gearing system, the game takes place on the same map of Hyrule, even the shrines are similar. You know, what took them six years? The scope of the game is very similar to the scope of Breath of the Wild, but they started with two first of the work already done. What took so long? What did they do for six years? And I believe I know the answer. Or at least I do have a guess. So we are entering conspiracy theory territory here, but hear me out. I believe the incredible intricate physics system is what took them so long to develop. A lot of things have been said about how incredibly great the physics system of Tears of the Kingdom is. And I have to agree, it's a technical marvel. It's insanity. It's not just impressive, it's completely unique. No other company ever even came close to pulling off something like this on this scale. In Tears of the Kingdom, it is possible to tie together a couple of random sets of items at one point of the map, carry them to another place, add some wheels there and then start to drive around on them. It is possible to cut down trees near a chasm only to build a way too long tree stump that we can then ride down into the depths. It's a game where we can build machines that freeze the water around us, that drop bombs on enemies, that automatically fish for us and whatnot. It's honestly utter insanity. All of this on an insane level of polish. It's insane what Nintendo built here and it is even more insane that they were able to build it on a switch, which finally brings us to the reason why the game has me so worried. Nintendo spent 12 years developing first Breath of the Wild and then Tears of the Kingdom. If my little assumption is correct, then they probably spent a significant part of those 12 years on the physics engine alone. Just to put things into perspective, development on Breath of the Wild began in 2011 after the release of Skyward Sword. Do you know which other game released in 2011? The original Dark Souls. From Software developed Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, Sekiro and Elden Ring in less time than it took Nintendo to develop Breath and Tears. If my theory is correct, then Nintendo spent so much time building the physics engine. A physics engine that gives them a huge competitive advantage over their competitors. You know, you simply don't throw such a physics engine away after using it in two games. The one thing that Tears of the Kingdom really improved over Breath of the Wild is the physics engine. They didn't fix a lot of the problems that were already present in Breath of the Wild. They didn't go back to the series roots. Instead, they doubled down on the physics gameplay. And this is what has me so worried about the future of Zelda. I'm worried that the Zelda series becomes a physics sandbox going forward. When playing Tears of the Kingdom at times, I had this feeling that there are two creative visions fighting against each other. Other. One side of the game wants to be a traditional Zelda game that features puzzles and combat and makes us explore ancient temples and fight epic bosses and whatnot. And another side of the game wants to be this physics sandbox that features tons of fun tricks and interactions but isn't really the best fit for a puzzle game or a dungeon. Both sides of the game are great but at some points the game just wants to be two paradoxical things at once and it is at those times that a lot of problems arise. I have zero doubt that Nintendo is going to release another game using this physics engine. Developing this beast simply must have been way too much work to simply throw it away after a game. But I really do hope that whatever this game may be, it isn't a Legend of Zelda game. I don't know about you, but I'm personally ready to leave the open world physics sandbox gameplay behind and to go back to a more streamlined Zelda experience after Tears of the Kingdom. 
Hooray! And with this, there is only one final thing left for us to discuss, the final boss fight against Ganondorf. We find him hidden deep down below Hyrule Castle. The path towards him is really great, it almost feels as if we descend into a forbidden area that we aren't meant to explore. The fight against Ganondorf himself is equally great. The second phase is especially marvelous. Ganondorf starts to use our own tricks against us and flurry rushes away when we try to hit him. At the same time, he steals our maximum health with some attacks which feels incredibly unfair, makes the fight appear even more difficult than it actually is. Finally, they make his health bar almost comically large, which is a great effect, you know? He doesn't have more health because the health bar is longer, it's just a fun little trick to make him feel even more intimidating and it works. It's great. The game ends with a logical conclusion. Ganondorf decides to swallow his secret stone as well, which transforms him into a demon dragon and we finish him off high above the sky of Hyrule. Which, which is a perfect way to end the game. In the final sequence, the light dragon transforms back into Zelda and we grab her hand while she falls down to the earth. That's a scene that wonderfully mirrors the beginning of the game when we weren't able to grab Zelda's hand when she fell into the abyss below Hyrule Castle. After beating the game, we now have grown in strength and this time we are able to grab her hand, which brings the game full circle and is a wonderful way to close out the game. Tears of the Kingdom is an incredible game. It is without a shadow of a doubt one of the best games I've ever played. But it is also a game that is deeply flawed. It solves a couple of the problems that Breath of the Wild had while also introducing new problems on its own. But most importantly, Tears of the Kingdom replicates a lot of Breath of the Wild's problems without even trying to fix them. The most impressive part of the game is its marvelous physics engine. I just hope that Nintendo takes this physics engine and spins it into its own thing. Because I'd love for the next Zelda game to be more streamlined again. But whatever the next Zelda game might be about, the most important thing is that it doesn't feature destructible rocks again. May those cursed things be gone. And with this, we've reached the end of this little video. Hooray! So before we wrap this up, I thought it might be a good idea to quickly chat about what to expect around here in the future and this channel in general. So first, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone. The reception of the previous video had been overwhelmingly positive and it looks like we're finally out of the algorithmical deadlock that was causing me so much headache. The video on the other channel actually reached more people than my other nine most recent releases did in the same time frame, which is honestly insane after such a long break. I've also wanted to say thanks to everyone who actually did take the time to check the Resident Evil 4 remake video out. I am super well aware that a Resident Evil 4 retrospective isn't the softest landing from what we were doing on the other channel. The original plan was to have four or five videos around here before sending you lovely people over here with something, you know, that actually makes sense, like a Mario retrospective, but the reveal of Mario Bros. Wonder completely messed up my plans, which, you know, is fine. Since everything was a bit messy, I thought it would be a good idea to say a couple of words on what to expect around here going forward. It's going to be a huge project, but the first thing that I want to tackle is to do a retrospective on every 3D Zelda game and afterwards on every 3D Mario game around here, starting with the Zelda series. Since producing those videos is an insane amount of work, like literally hundreds of hours per video, I think it's best to rotate things around a bit, because otherwise I'll work on just the Zelda series for literally thousands of hours at once, which sounds like the road to burnout to me. So what we're going to do around here is alternate between discussing a Zelda game and one other game, likely an indie or something that is currently of relevance, until we covered all Zelda games and then I want to proceed and do the 3D Mario games in the exact same way. So the next thing around here will be Hollow Knight, a game I wanted to discuss for, for literally 75 years and a game that I have a half-finished script lying around for over four years now and then we'll chat about Ocarina of Times. Hooray! Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you got at least some entertainment and value out of this video. If you liked it, liking it back would be a gentleman move. And if you're interested in more long-form content, discussing games, subscribing might be a good idea as well. Alright, thanks for watching until hopefully next time. Lots of hugs.